Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Hello, this is Pastor Duncans. I am here in our Port Norris location, and I have some great news for you. You know, I, I don't know why God does this. Well, and then again, I do know why God does this, but I just started my series in the Psalms when all of a sudden, you know, I believe that the Word of God needs to be relevant, that the Word of God needs to make sense, that the Word of God needs to reflect the needs of the people. And even though I love the Psalms, right in the middle of the Psalms, God now has me doing a switch. I need you to tune in Wednesday night. You don't want to miss this. Here's what I want to say to you. What about if these are the good old days? What about if things don't get any better? Are these the last days? What about if they never find a cure? More people die. Uh, no cures in sight right now. What about if the food supply and the chains where we get our resources fall apart and supermarkets doesn't have anything and jobs go, continue to go and the economy breaks and falls. I'm gonna say this. What I'm telling you is God told me to do a message, a series entitled How to Survive, How to Be Victorious in this pandemic. How to live tough during this pandemic. I want to talk to you about the prophetic nature of the days we're living in and how you can produce a quality life under that pressure. Look, all I want you to do is tune in to this new series. You'll see one of our commercials. And I'm telling you, this is something straight from the heart of God. We will find out prophetically where we are in the Bible and where we are in our heart and where we are as far as God keeping us as believers. Tune in. Don't forget, living tough in the pandemic. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan. I'll see you Wednesday night. Good evening. This is Pastor Duncan saying welcome to Understanding How to Extend Your Faith here at Shiloh Baptist Church. Get comfortable. Grab whatever you need. We are going to take a ride through this Bible, understanding where we are prophetically in the last days. Here's what this Bible study is called. Could this be the last days? Are we living in the last times? You better think about it. We're not talking about, and I, this is my third week, we're not just talking about missing, you know, paper towels and toilet paper. We're talking about now kids not going to school. Well, forget that. A school system in our country interrupted, lives interrupted, uh, the matriculation of education interrupted, you as parents not knowing what's going on with your jobs, finances, every sign that we point to tells us that we need to ask this question. And I know I'm not the only one that has asked that question. Are these the last days? Here's what gets a kicker. Is this or could this be as good as it gets? We're running out around now talking about what we don't have and how bad things are. But what about if these are the good old days? What about if, you know, having a roof over your head, having food on the shelves in the supermarket? How about if those are the good old days? Come on, go with me and understand biblically. This world wasn't going to last forever. I've had the unfortunate pleasure of watching folks' loved ones die during this pandemic. And I watched them still agonize as each death comes about. And the one thing that I've been able to tell everyone, and I know my people are listening because I can't put this into any kind of way I can give them comfort. The one comfort we have is the comfort that you and I know, and you know what that is? That God has a time for everything. God is an on-time God. He knows what's happening. What we have to do is understand God's times and make sure that we get on board with God. So what I'm talking about is how do we live tough 
during this pandemic? How do we get ready to fight the pressure and the things we're going through? How are we strong enough to handle? You know, a lot of us fake it, like everything's okay. You know, like going to the trip to the dentist, while you're sitting there like you're strong, sitting out in the waiting office till you hear that drill kicks in. All I'm telling you is we have to understand how do we get there. So our teaching basically says, could, are we living in the last days? Nobody knows for sure. Once you write this scripture down, I'm not gonna read, 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 uh, go there again, but I want you to understand that Matthew 24 tells us that nobody knows when the last days are. But I share with you Amos 3 and 3, God always informs his prophets. So get somebody here and let them learn this together because how I started was I told you about the seven signs of the last days that's in the Mount Olive Discourse. And I shared with you that Jesus, the largest sermon Jesus preached was the Sermon on the Mount. And after the Sermon on the Mount comes the Mount Olive Discourse. And all of that is in red letters where Jesus is telling us, so get ready. I don't want you scared, but I want you ready. I don't want you to turn me off because I want you ready. I want you to understand that there is an end time sequence. Watch this. So we could be at that first stage. What's the first stage? The rapture of the church. First Corinthians tells us that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. So the rapture of the church is when God takes his church out. God tells us that he's going to save us from wrath. So as I said in the last teaching, I'm teaching from a pre-trib Understanding pre-tribulation just means that I believe God is going to take us out of here before the tribulation starts. So here's where we are. Get, the, get these uh, end time sequence. Understand this. So first there is the rapture of the church. You got that. You saved right now, you can be raptured. After that, the Antichrist will present himself. The Antichrist will come on the scene. The unveiling of the Antichrist. After we're raptured out, he's going to try to bring their nations together. After the Antichrist comes, there's going to be a time when there's going to be a, a tribulation period come on the scene. But when the Antichrist is revealed, then there's going to be the time of tribulation, which is that seven-year period where God is going to continue to pour out his wrath on the nation. Seven years. Rapture, Antichrist, tribulation. Then there'll be the battle of Og and Magog. Og and Magog is when this alliance will come together. Now you do know I told you, you got to get the last teaching that all of this end time is about God's chosen people. God's going to get done with Israel during this time. But there's going to be the battle of Og and Magog. Magog is a plain in the Middle East. And that's where the battle is going to be fought. But the great thing is God intervenes with supernatural power and then his people are, are saved because they can't destroy. But then the Antichrist is angry. There's a treaty broken. That is the desolation, uh, abomination of desolation. That means that there's going to be an abominable spirit that comes on the earth when the Antichrist is unleashes all the evil. There is going to be a partnership with hell. They're going to come together and the earth is going to be a place where nobody can be inhabited in it. And then after the abomination of desolation, there is going to be the battle of Armageddon. That's when Christ comes back and saves his people from heaven. After that, there's going to be a judgment of those who came out of the tribulation period. All those who did not accept Christ, you know, who took the mark of the beast, they're going to be judged. There's going to be a separation of people after that. And then Satan's going to be bound for a season. He'll be bound, and that's going to take us into the millennial period. During the millennial period, a thousand years is a millennial. There'll be a time when Satan is going to be loosed again. After Satan is loosed again, there's going to be the final Battle. Some people are still going to be deceived. The final battle, and then after the final battle, the white throne judgment. The white throne judgment, that's when all those not believers get judged because of all the time they had to receive Christ. Then after the white throne judgment, we'll have a, a time of new heaven and new earth, or new creation, new heaven and new earth. So that's the sequence. Then I gave you last week that we don't have to worry about that because we have seven foundational principles that we can live by. You need to write these down. The first one is God is the ruler of the universe. 
So if I know God and God is ruling the universe, then I am fine. I don't have to worry about what the rest of the world worries about. The second thing is my biggest enemy is me. Write it down. Don't let anybody fool you. No one can make you do anything. It's when you need to understand that the biggest person I have to control is me. How many understand that? My temper. My struggle. My fault line. Come on. We have to learn to control ourselves. We're good at controlling other people, but the biggest way to get to your blessing is to learn to control you. And I gotta admit to some of y'all, I have a hard time controlling myself. Can I get an amen? Come on, there are times when I know the word, I'm holy, I believe God, I'm trying to live for God. But it just, I just can't control myself. Then we found out not only number two, the seven pound principles, the third principle is, and I love this principle, it tells us that grace is precious beyond measure. I'm not going to go there. You got to go back and get the last teaching because I got stuck here before. Grace, I need it. All of us need it. Grace is that measure. It is so precious that none of us could survive without God being gracious to us. Not only that, but the fourth principle is, which we all need to understand, and I love this one, is God gloriously transforms our lives. Let me stop and slow down a minute. If, I'm trying to get to where I'm going tonight. If your life has been transformed, can you please go try and take credit? It's not you. And you know it's not you. God has blessed you tremendously. And God has blessed you tremendously so that you could be where he wants you to be. If you've gotten over anything, how many know it was God that did it? And then the fifth principle is the one that we all have a starting point in God. It's the biggest part of God's attributes. Love is our key. Because that's the biggest part of God's attributes. And then, of course, the sixth thing is, and I love, I love, I would stay on love, but I talked about this. God's word is our light. Understand that. Without the word, I won't survive. And number seven, here's the center of our universe. The gospel of the cross is the only thing that works. All right, so back up with me. I know I'm going fast, but I'm going to get somewhere tonight so we can move into that next area of how to handle the pressure. We're going to get there. How to live tough, how to be strong, how to know not only that you are not a victim, you have the victory. Not only to know that through every trial, you're going to get a triumph, but to understand what God has invested in us tonight. So I just gave you the seven foundational principles, and those seven principles, and you would say, okay, Pastor, this is the end time. Okay, the church is going to be raptured. We know the Antichrist is coming. We know things are bad. But why should we worry? There it is. Why do believers, especially we got those seven principles, have to worry about living tough in the pandemic? Oh, I'm getting ready to tell you why it's important that even though you have those principles, even though you know you're going to be raptured, even though God is on your side, you still have a lot to lose if you don't understand. Why do believers have to worry about living tough in the pandemic? Here's what we said. And here's what we said. Well, we have, this, we have the seven foundation principles that guide our life. Uh, if this is the end, we're going to be raptured. And the last thing is, we know we are going to heaven. Let's talk about heaven. Because at the end of all of this, what scares folk, I don't care what anybody says, what life boils down to is not where you live on this side, where you're going to live on the other side. Some of you are wasting time being frightful in this pandemic. You have God on your side. Quit worrying. Quit struggling. Start trusting. But also you need to understand that my biggest goal is I'm going to be ready to get to heaven. I mean, it's bad when I go to the cupboard and there's no food in the cupboard. It's bad when there's no gas in the car. It's bad when I don't have bill money. But those are temporary situations. No one will be real bad. And when you get to heaven and you know that there was another place you should have been, that you should have been more prepared, I believe that's when it says God's going to wipe every tear. Listen to me. You're worried about the wrong stuff. We major on the minors. First thing first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. 
Did everything else will follow. Let's make sure we keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is how am I prepared in my relationship with God on this side and my relationship with God in heaven. You should be preparing yourself for how you're going to live in glory. There's some mansions given out. I want my mansion. There's going to be some rewards given out. I don't want to stand up there and know I failed God because I was all wrapped up in me instead of in God. So all this is cool. Let's look at heaven. And I love scriptures on heaven. John 5, 24 tells us, Most assuredly I say to you, he, hear, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from life to death. All right. So we know that the key to our life is we heard the word and we believed it. And when we believe the word, that moment, can you hear me? We pass from life to death. So I don't have to worry about the end time. I've already passed from life to death based on the fact that I received God's word. And here's what I was talking about a moment ago about my mansion. God said, let not your heart be troubled. I need to focus right there. I'm going to get to the rest of the teaching. I know it's scary. I know everything's up in the air. I know our world is topsy-turvy. You think about we may never have fellowship again. We may never have church again. And I came through the time of civil rights and struggle and understanding black folk. Do you realize we can't even high-five no more? Hallelujah. High-five is part of my cultural existence. I can see a brother away from somewhere I never heard before. And we come up to each other and we do the high five, we do the handshake. I'm just talking about the cultural nuances of who we are. But not only that, the urge to, to, to help and hug someone when you have a brother or sister in trouble. Can't do that anymore. The urge to, you know, to reach out and touch somebody. Can't do that anymore. There's a whole lot of things that lets us know. He said, I go to, watch this word, prepare! Are you prepared for heaven? Are you really prepared? Are you so stuck on earth that, that you're not going to make it to heaven because you're not prepared? He said, I went to prepare a place for you. It would be a shame that I prepared a place and we don't go and we're not ready to go. All that is good. We have all those things. But watch this, guy. We still have to live through it. There is the key. It doesn't make a difference how much scripture you know that God is a healing. If you're sick, you still got to get through the operation. It doesn't make a difference how much you know about God can take away my worry, but you still got to have some nights where you sit up and live through the worry. What am I telling you? You can have all of those things you need, but if you're not prepared to live through them, you got to learn how to live and apply this word that we're talking about. It's not, look, there was times that we were going from church service to church service, from someone else's prayer, someone else's shout, to all this holy stuff, because now this pandemic has isolated all the foolishness. You really got to be saved by yourself. You got to know that God is touching you. I know people, every little thought, uh, a cough, <coughs> but God, uh, I might have that wrong. What's going on? Temperature going up. Am I hot? Feel me. Am I hot? We, we go into these things where we let our anxieties and our struggle take us. You know, I just heard a report today. Check it out. Friday, a report came out by the CDC that says 40% of Americans, and they took a major research of a major cross-section of the country, 40% of Americans have had at least one mental or behavioral crisis. I know, you sit there saying, I'm not going to identify myself, but there are moments when you can be walking and say, what is this? Where am I? What's going on? And all I'm telling you is that mental pressure is building. That's what I want to teach you to handle. That mental struggle is building. That's what you better learn. How am I going to make sure I don't lose my Life before I lose my life by falling prey to all of the stuff that's going on in our world, all the craziness out there. We got to live through it. Matter of fact, they call it the Circle of Life. I remember watching uh, the movie Lion King. That's a cool song, The Circle of Life. But the Circle of Life is real. 
I'm trying to tell you what you have to live through. Look at what the circle of life is. Um, it is a it is the presentation of watch this. You were born. You have to survive, and then you die. We're on that second word right now. We're trying to survive. Don't let anybody fool you. We are trying to survive. Help me, Holy Ghost. What God is saying, everything that is born has the ability to survive, but you still have to survive. There is prey and predator. The world goes around in a circle. I was watching uh, the Nature Channel and I saw these wildebeests and these lions were sneaking up on them. And the wildebeest have their horns and they have the ability, if they're not caught off guard, to fight off the lion or they can outrun the lion. So the lion snuck up on them. You know the bad thing is, although every wildebeest had horns, every wildebeest had legs, you know, a couple of them got caught. Make sure you're not the one that gets caught. I'm trying to teach you how to survive. Even though you have scriptures, even though you know how to pray, even though you have the Lord, even though you are a praiser, you still have to use that stuff and survive. How do we do that? Our problem. Here is what our problem is. Why we have to survive. Spiritual warfare. The circle of life is bad. But we were born again. We're in a different type of survival. You now are stuck in a place where spirits are attacking you constantly. Let's talk about it. From a Christian perspective, spiritual warfare. Somebody says, it's getting spooky. No, there is real, demonic, dark activity that is trying. If you can't recognize when the enemy is on your back, you don't feel like praying, I don't feel like reading, I don't feel like praising. I, you know what? Uh, when this when this pandemic first hit, man, I was scrolling through YouTube trying to find me some preaching. Now I turn on anything else but preaching. When I get home, my television isn't set to God. I only shoot to God when I need something. You don't think that's spiritual warfare? The enemy is putting you in a vulnerable position so everything he puts in your mind puts you in right in the middle of this culture and you're doing just what the world does. No, you got to force yourself to get a pattern of prayer, build your relationship, and know who you are in God. You can lose yourself in God. James says it like this. Anybody who is double-minded is like a man who looks in the mirror. You walk away and forget what you look like. That's what the pandemic will do for us. Watch this. But well, we're in a battle of good versus evil. How bad is this battle? I am glad you asked that. This is how bad the battle is. It is a battle that is fought daily between God and Satan. Now, that's interesting. I got to tell you how it's fought between God and Satan. It's fought between God and Satan. You say, Pastor, God is all powerful. Yeah, he is. But we're not. The world's not. Satan is still the God of this world. So what happens? The devil rejoices in getting the world to turn over into darkness. It's, it's a battle between God and the devil because somewhere in the devil's delusional mind, every time he gets a battle, a victory over one of God's children, he just wins another battle when he gets a victory. I know if you go online now, you will read there are several, several long-term pastors and preachers who now, one article I read said, why I walked away from the church. That wasn't too bad. Another one said, why I don't believe in God anymore. What am I telling you? The battle that the devil uses is everything he can because he believes even to the end. You know, I, I think about it all the time. Doesn't he know he couldn't stop Jesus from getting up? He couldn't stop you and I from getting saved. He couldn't stop God whenever God really wants to do anything because God is sovereign. But every day he is battling. Because you know why? He's trying to get as many casualties as he can. You know, I know. 
People who used to be saved. People who used to shout. People who used to be strong. Now you can't even stand your ground anymore. That's the battle. Every day. Spiritual battle. Working on us a little bit more. Between the Christian church and the world system ruled by our spiritual enemy. The world. I'm going to get in trouble right here because some of my folks said, Pastor, it's only a TV show. But I'm going to say it. Green leaf. I don't like it. Because all it shows is the negative stuff in the church. That's right. There may be some infidelity. There may be some stealing of money. But we should not allow the world to make us think that's what God's church does. Now, we as saved believers may say, well, I don't believe that. But think about if you're unsaved. All you're going to sit there and go, mm-hmm. I know it. That's what Pastor Tuck is doing. Yeah, that's what the church is doing right over there. I know. That's what they do. And the world tells us, so the world does that. And not only the world does this, it tells us, it tries to make us be, hmm, I gotta say this properly. It, it tries to make us be politically correct, and it ties political correctness into how we love people. And I'm speaking specifically with my LGBTQIA brothers and sisters homosexual, they try to make it seem like, they get us down to that part where they say, well, and there's some people that fall for this trick. Um, well, you know that? That's wrong. There's a lot of things wrong. I'm not compromising, but what the devil wants to do is bring the world into a predominant position that's against God, make us have to speak out, but not just speak out because we speak the truth, but speak out and seem like we're villains, like we don't love people. No. I, God is not Share this with me, every believer here. You better learn how to love everybody. I don't care what their sexual persuasion, I don't care who they are, our job is to love them because that's what God does. Now, what's right and wrong, that's what the Bible talks about. And if you ask me, I gotta tell you what the scripture says. But if you need, you need me to take, give me a ride down to the store, you need me to come help you with your kids, we need to quit letting the world drag us into a battle of love and not a battle of right and wrong, so that we can understand we have to preach the same message God preached. I don't have time to stay on this, but when the woman was caught in adultery, there was, there was law. There was law. Good Christians grab the rock. You, if you look, Pastor, oh, I don't know what that Pastor Don is talking about. He done compromised the gospel. No, what I need you to see, hun, is all of us. Don't have a right. None of us have a right to pick up a rock against anybody else unless you're going to first drop that rock on your foot. Because the reality is, that's not showing love. Jesus showed us, he forgave the woman, then he could lead her on. How are you going to preach to somebody hatred and do the work of Christ? I'm going to leave it alone. Don't write me. Put something in the chat. And I'll be able to answer you back. All I'm telling you is, there's no way you can tell me that we can't love people no matter what their condition. But what the world does, it sets us up as adversaries. That's what it did to Jesus, and that's why it had to destroy Christ. And within every child of God, here's the biggest one. Every one of us have a battle. Spiritual battle is between God and Satan. It's between the world and the church. And it's between every child of God and the lust of our flesh. How do we know that? Let's look at some scripture. First, I want to show you, Billy Graham had a great book that explained and gave a definition of what spiritual warfare was in his book on angels. I love him. How many of, how many of you know that the Bible speaks a lot about angels? Uh, that angels come down to do the work of God, that God allows, and he, he dispatches angels over us. Uh, we had a song when I was growing up, all day, all night, angels watching over me, my Lord. What am I telling you? Angels are those spirits of God, those servants of the Lord that he is allowed to work in conjunction with us believers. You better know, when, when I was growing up, and many, many people believe this, nothing in the Bible says we're going to turn into angels. You know, nothing says we're going to turn into angels. The Bible says we're going to be a redeemed creation. I don't know what we're going to look like, but we are not going to turn into angels. I'll say it again. We are not going to turn into angels. The Bible tells us in Psalms 8, what is man? Thou has made him a little lower than the angel. That lower just means because we were down on this side and not in God's throne room. 
but all of us were made in the image and likeness of God, we're going to be ruling the earth with God again. Our, my, my angelic brothers, those spirits are going to be there with us. But we need to understand spiritual warfare is against fallen angels. It's against the spirits of Satan. Let's look at that. What do I mean by that? This is what Billy Graham said. We live in a perpetual battlefield. The wars among the nations on earth are mere pop gun affairs compared to the fierceness of battle in the spiritual unseen world. Man, my brother and sister, I'm going to tell you something. Satan is so subtle. He has destroyed your children. He will destroy your marriage. He will destroy your mind. He will make you fearful. He'll make you live in a living hell. He'll put you in a place with all the scriptures you know, with all the church you've been doing, with all of the praying to God, with all of the shouting about you a believer. You still have to know that the battle we're in is fierce. It is a real battle. Uh, it, it separates chief friends. It separates those who love one another. Anything good going on and falls apart, you can know is spiritual warfare. Watch this. This invisible spiritual conflict is waged around us incessantly and unremittingly. The devil is not everywhere at all times. But you know what he does? He sends demonic spirits into our life so they can, and you know what he does? He tries to learn us so well that he sends the correct spirit. The devil's not going to send me a, a spirit of gluttony because he knows I'm not going to deal with that. He's not going to send me a spirit of cocaine. I'm not going to deal with that. He sends me, I'm not going to tell you what spirit he's going to send me. Aha, none of your business. But he's going to send a spirit that I like. He's going to send a temptation that I like. He's going to appeal to the heat in my flesh. What am I talking about? The Bible says you can quench all the fiery darts. He will trigger a sin in my nature. Ooh, I'm talking to somebody tonight. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to make you think the pandemic is going to make you more vulnerable. No, you're just as strong now as you were before the pandemic started. And if you hang in there with God, you will be stronger than you were. Because you're going to have to deal with more darkness. Ephesians 6, well, 10 through 17, but 11 and 12 here says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And when you look at the different denominations, I'm not teaching spiritual warfare now, but every one of those demonic forces have been assigned to you and me to destroy us. We've wrestled with some and didn't even know it. You ever have a knockdown scream to the veins popping in your neck, battle with your spouse? Um, how about with your children, where you were just so angry? If we could have taken a spiritual photograph of you then, you would have been all the way in the demonic zone. Because anything that evil, that kind of anger, comes from Satan in us. It is a spirit that drives us and allows. So we're fighting against all kinds of spirits. You ever walk into your house and a darkness came over you? Could have been the devil was preparing a spiritual trap. So when you got home, I just don't feel good. I don't know what this is. Then he gets you in a pattern of winding. I don't know what's going on. He can make you drag your own life down because you don't understand that I got to break myself out of this. And you're playing to his hands. I start repeating what he said. The devil whispering in here. I don't feel good. I don't feel good. I'm hurting all the time. Nothing in this house ain't never right. I'm never going to get out of this. And we fall into these traps of the enemy because the wickedness is in high places, meaning he is trying to make sure that we don't make it. What's the next area? Ecclesi Watch this verse, guys. You need to get this. Ecclesiastes 7 and 20 says, Indeed, believe this, watch it. There is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. I'll say it again in case you got one of those angelic, you know, Holy Ghost filled, 
brothers who's, and sisters who think they don't ever do nothing wrong and they're putting their finger at everybody else. I want to tell you, I didn't say this. The Bible says all of us sin. Let me tell you how I know how easily sin can get you. Don't y'all stop listening to me when I start confessing stuff. Because I just like to tell people stuff because I see the enemy working in my life. And I like to tell you about it. But I had been out one day and I saw one of my buddies we were talking. And I had been out that morning and rode my bike. And I rode my bike about 12 miles. And so my buddy said, wow, oh, where you been? What you been doing? I said, I've been out riding my bike. How far you ride? I said, oh, about 16 miles. Wait a minute. You just said you. I remember walking away thinking, why did I say 16 and not 12? Because the devil is always trying to make you be better than you are. He's trying to make you lift yourself up. If I had done 10, I would have said 12. If I had done 5, I would have said 7. Why do we do that? Because we don't count that as a sin. I know you're listening to me. I'm not the only one. We call it. I exaggerate. Tell a little lie. No, a little lie is a big hole in your spirit. I remember walking away and the spirit of God immediately condemned me. And I remember telling him, he said, man, you know you got to say it in a nice way because you don't want everybody to know you messed up, right? Well, that's, man, you know what? I don't think I did uh, 16. I think it was only about 12. Oh, man, that's still good. I didn't really repent all the way, but I did it enough. So I felt a little better. But God didn't let me forget that as holy as we try to be, watch out, we're in spiritual warfare to the sin in our nature. Not only that, Selfishness. This verse in Philippians when Paul, and we love this verse because Paul is talking about the resurrection power of God and, you know, forgetting those things behind and reaching forth to things ahead. But he starts out talking about evildoers, evil workers, and dogs. He talks about saints of God who, watch this, this, this text always messed me up, whose end is destruction. Wait a minute, Paul. We're talking about believers here. You can't say there's a believer whose end is going to be destruction. He said, yeah, I can. You know why? Because their God is their belly. Here's what he said. They're more concerned about their flesh than they are about their spirit. It's all about, I've left the spiritual realm, which takes sacrifice. I don't want to be spiritual all the time. It takes sacrifice. It takes giving up me. It takes giving up time. It takes doing stuff I may not want to do at that moment in my flesh. But if you don't sacrifice those moments, you never get to the power moments. If you allow your belly, your flesh to be your God, then you're going to be weak when it comes to sport, spiritual warfare. It says, who in their shame who mind earthly things. Watch out for sin, spiritual warfare. Watch out for self, spiritual warfare. Watch out for Satan. I talked about Satan when I talked about the principalities and powers, but you need to get this verse. Be sober. The word sober there means be clear-headed. Now, don't think that's so easy. Clear-headed, clear-minded means I got to be quick to recognize the devil, not slow. I got to know before I allow my emotions to change, before I allow my actions to change, I got to be sober enough to know this is God. Before I destroy my house, destroy my job, destroy my children, I got to know this is God. Before you go in there and tell your boss off, even though they're evil, you ought to realize that's not God's weapons that you use to fight your battle. Look what it says. Be sober, be vigilant. He magnifies it. Uh, it's being on a quest. It means I wake up in the morning, I get so clear-headed that I'm not looking for the devil, but I'm not going to let him sneak up on me and do a sneak attack. I'm going to be ready. I'm not going to let myself get pulled all the way down. I'm talking to somebody right now. You let him, all, all the power you have, all the deliverance you have in your life, all of the prayers you have prayed, all the other people you laid hands on and prayed for, oh, let me pray for you, honey, all those other folk that you have said, God is able, how come? 
You're so deaf. The Bible tells us. Because the devil is as a roaring lion seeking. That word seeking speaks volumes. He's looking for someone to destroy. That's our problem. That's why I'm telling you, even though end times is coming, yeah, we're going to heaven, yes, we're going to be raptured, but in the end times, we better watch out because there's still going to be more spiritual devastation on the earth. Even though we are saved, we have to handle and survive the pressures we all must live under. There's not a believer out here who can tell you that they don't have some... I, there's some days I start off my day, anybody being honest, man, everything is fine, da 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 beautiful day. All of a sudden, for a new minute, I'm in the middle of a mental battle, and I'm in the middle of praying myself clear, I'm in the middle of anxiousness trying to run in. All of these things come because i got to be prepared for the pressure. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to get you prepared for the pressure we have to live under. What is that? Here is what you're fighting for. We're fighting for our destiny. Destiny is a great word for a believer. It means that before I was even born, God had worked out all of the traps in the road, all of the tricks of the enemy. He had worked out all the pitfalls he has a destination for me. My spiritual warfare, the reason the devil is fighting me so hard, he doesn't want me to reach my destiny. He knows that I'm going to damage his kingdom. He knows that there's more in you. Think about where you came from. You might have come from the streets, from a bar. I don't know where, what kind of life you live. You might have been the biggest sinner. Look at you now. Look at the anointing you command. Look at the demons that tremble when you walk in. Look at how people walk around and say, oh, that person knows the Lord because they can see the anointing in your life. You think the devil's not mad that you used to be his? You think the enemy doesn't want, you think he wants you just to walk into your destiny, have all the prosperity you want, have your children blessed, have your house blessed? You think the enemy just going to let you go? No. The spiritual warfare, the pressure I'm defining to you, all of it is designed so I don't reach what God already told me I will reach. And you don't believe it, look how far you come right now. That's nothing but the goodness and grace of God that I am who I am. And pretty soon, when you start believing it, oh my God, the devil really got a problem then. Because now, this used to be drunk, used to be drug addict, used to be whoremonger, used to be streetwalker, used to be cuss up some liar, fighter. You walking around now and you believe you're doing it? You believe? Man, the devil got problems with you. Walking around talking about, I'm buying you out of my house. That's why you got so many problems. Because there's a destiny that you are walking in that the enemy does not want you to walk in. He tried to get Goliath to take out David before he was even born. Before he could even rise up and take his position as king. The devil always has a plan. He tried to destroy, destroy Joseph before he could become second in command. Ah, and save the whole Jewish nation. He tries to destroy you. Mary Magdalene had seven demons in her, yet she became one of Jesus' best disciples. He tried seven demons to take her out, and yet she found her place of destiny walking with the Lord. Don't tell me this is not special. I feel an anointing in your house. If you're a believer, there's something over top of you called the glory of God that has been guiding your life and your destiny. Sometimes you need to stand strong just because I have a destiny. How many know you felt your destiny before and you know if you're saved now, you're in where God told you to be. This is not who you were, but it's who you were born to be. It's not who you was, but it is who you was before there was a was because God determined that's what you should be. No way in the world I ever thought I'd be a preacher. That was not my calling. I had other plans. But God has a destiny. Look for me. Fight for your destiny. Let me show you why you should fight for your destiny. I want you to write this down. This will bless you. 
This is why you fight for your destiny. First, I fight to be who God made me. Look at what God told Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 5. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, and before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you. That word sanctification is a gospel word where God said, hands off. He set you apart for the position. You know why the devil can trouble you but never stop you? It's because God set you apart for this position. So he has to fight against you and God to take you out of where you are. So the enemy is trying to stop you from becoming who you already are. I know that sounds kind of oxymoronic, but let me tell you. That's who you really are. When you are weak, and pitiful, and the devil's walking all over you, and stealing your family, and stealing things out of your house, and stealing your life. That's not who you are. Before you were born, God didn't choose any junk. God didn't choose weak people. He didn't choose people to fall apart. He chose us to recognize we have to deal with the pressure, and we have to become who God made us. I said, God, why in the world did you make me a preacher? I did not want to be anybody's preacher. How come I can't run around and have some fun? Go on to the hospital, praying for everybody. People calling you up, thinking you have the knowledge. Pastor, what do I do about this? Sometimes you're panicking on the other end of the phone saying, Holy Spirit, tell me something. I learned. Sometimes I, I say things and I know that it wasn't me. It was the Spirit of God. God spoke through me in spite of me. Oh, that's a good line. But it's a real truth. How many know that you found yourself weak, but you were able to encourage someone else? You found yourself struggling, but a word came out of you that sent somebody else's burdens flying. It's because you're acting in that image of who God made you. Know what, I'll make, know what ought to make you shout is when you realize Wow, this is exciting. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta keep going to find out what my destiny is. I gotta keep running because there's some stuff in me that I'm gonna see that's so exciting, I can't even fathom it. Some of us don't realize the reason you should run this race with strength and the reason you should keep serving God hard and keep sacrificing is because down the end of the road, you're gonna see a spectacular, supernatural destiny where you can lay hands on people and they recover. Where you can speak words and deliverance will come. Where you can get up in the morning and demons will flee from you knowing that the first thing you want to do is zero in on the word of God. Why do I fight? Why must I live strong? First, I got to make sure I find my destiny. What's the first thing my destiny? I got to figure out who God made me. Second thing, I got to figure out what God has planned for me. Oh, God has some exciting plans for all of us. Look at this. Jeremiah 29, 11. One of the, you know, I know you love this scripture and sometimes we take it out of context and it's really about the children of Israel and a prophecy, but you need to understand something. Jeremiah said, I know the plans that I have for you. All God was saying, even though you're in a foreign country, even though now you're under the battle, even though now it looks like you're losing, even though now it looks like you don't have strength, cheer up, my brother and sister, hear me right now. There is some power in you because God has a plan for you. Think about you as a parent. You ever, you ever sat around daydreaming about the plans you had or had for your children? Do you realize that if you had the power, how many of us out there would have made sure our children got to everything I planned for them? Unfortunately, we didn't have the power. But you want to shout? God has the power to bring forth the plan that he has for your life. God has the power to make sure that he goes, and look what God said. Shouldn't this excite you? I know the thoughts. That means God's thinking of me. The next time the enemy is pulling you down, you ought to let him know, rehearse in his ears. Hey, man, watch out. God's thinking of me, and if God's thinking of me, God is still able to help me. So I got to make sure I know, I go to my destiny, who am I in God? 
I got to get to what God has planned for me. Next, what we need to overcome. John 16, 33. I think this is one of the most foundational texts that I learned when I first got into pastoring. Um, because I, I don't have time to go into those stories. But when you dip yourself into a spiritual realm and you're not all the way prepared for it, God will send a word that will let you understand what's going on. John 16, 33, Jesus was doing that for his disciples. He said, these things have I spoken unto you, that you might have peace. For in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God, what is your overcoming got to do with me? God said, I have already overcome the world world. So God has overcome the world and I'm depending on God. That makes me an overcomer also. Last thing about my destiny. How God will help me make it. Psalm 138 said the Lord will perfect. Somebody asked me. Somebody as will tell you. Perfect sounds like a good word but you know what the Holy Spirit is saying? God is saying if I have to make you go through that trial over and over again until you learn, I'm going to make you go through until it is perfected. The word perfect in biblical time has to do with maturity. God is saying, I'm going to allow you to continue to go through this struggle until you're mature enough to handle it. Why, God? Why must I go over and over? Why over and over? God said, because I have a plan for you, and you're not going to be able to handle your destiny until you go through that. Being broke was part of God's plan for you to get to your destiny. Being sick was part of God's plan. Struggling mentally and emotionally, God said, that was part of my plan. I had to perfect you for the destiny I have for you. And any of us who made it through those times realize that we are a lot more mature. There's some things now we say, devil, do your worst. Go ahead, do what you want. Some things used to make you cry, you can laugh at now. Some things used to make you stop and shiver. You now know scripture. Come on, somebody. You now know the word of God for it. God is telling you, sounds good. The Lord said, I will perfect that which concerned thee. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hand. Let that scripture sink in. How God perfects us, he takes us through a trial that we may not think is fair. It's almost like a young child trying to ride a bike and they've been used to training wheels. God's going to take those training wheels off. You, you've been reading enough now. You've been praying enough now. You got enough word in you. You gotta handle this by yourself. He'll make sure that there's gonna be a night when you're all by yourself and have to handle a struggle that you don't like. Because he's trying to mature you and perfect you. And in the middle of it, just remember these words. Lord, don't forsake me. Help the work of your hands. Please continue to work with me. What else do we do to fight for our destiny? We need the word to win. Isaiah 55 and 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth. This is such a powerful text. I want you to read it. God said, my word that comes out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me empty, but it shall prosper. Watch this. It will accomplish what I say, and it will prosper wherever I send it. My brothers and sisters, how you fight for your destiny is there's only one answer. There's only one way to fight. I have to have the word of God. More word and more word and more word. So when I get to understanding my destiny and my spiritual warfare, I know that the only way I win is to constantly fill my heart with the word of God. The word of God, listen to me, will make you cry. Sometimes from the harshness of the truth. The word of God will make you laugh uncontrollably from the power in the text. The word of God can make you shout with joy just from hearing a word. Open up ye gates and the king of glory 
shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. When you hear a word that identifies and takes your heart to that place of the word, you get blessed. Our destiny. So, I got to tell you this. And I'm going to end with these two thoughts tonight. You'll pick up with me next week. There's no such thing as a normal life. There's only um, unregenerate, dead life. So, so let me tell you what I'm talking about. So we fight for our destiny. The world is fighting to be normal. If a Christian is telling me, Pastor, all I want is a normal life, I got news for you. No such thing. Life is life. If you're going to be prepared for this end time push, then you need to understand, either I am living an unregenerate, dead life, what does Scripture say? Ephesians 2, 1 and 12. As for you, you were dead in your transgression and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and you were trapped by Satan. So, you're not fighting for your destiny because you're dead. But believers, we are not fighting for normal because we're spiritual. We're fighting to be what God created us to be. What am I talking about? There is regenerated Zoe life. Zoe is a good Greek word that talks about a full abundant, supernatural, over the top. It's kind of like where we believe things that unbelievers can't believe. We will believe that God's going to heal us and we're in the midst of a terrible disease. We believe God will supply a need so much so that we're going to look in the mailbox and we have nothing coming, but something may come because our faith says God's going to do it. That's called Zoe life. It's a life that's above and beyond. This is a man is so good. We're on a high. We're riding on a life that you never thought about. You, we got a life that when you get up in the morning, no matter how bad it is, whatever's against you, watch this. We get on our knees and pray. So I said, what is prayer doing? It's bombarding, opening up the gates of heaven, pouring out an anointing in my life. How do you think some of us made it? There were some days God lifted us up with prayer. And brought us back to a place of sanity. But remember, I gotta take you through this pressure. Don't try to live through this pressure to be normal. No, no, you're supernatural. You're above normal. We now live the Zoe life. What kind of life is that? John 10:10. 10, 10. The thief comes not except to kill, steal, and destroy. Look what God said. I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The high life of God. The abundant life of God. That abundant life means that I always have a chance because I have God. I know this is getting good. Let me wrap up by giving you a sequence. I wanted you to see how this could be the last time. I showed you the seven signs of the last time. I showed you the end time sequence. And I showed you why we as believers, even though there's an end time sequence that says we're going to be raptured, we haven't left yet. We still got to learn how to live through this. The cycle of life said I still have to learn how to survive. Once I learn how to survive, I got to understand why I'm fighting to survive. I'm fighting because of spiritual warfare. And why am I fighting because of spiritual warfare? Because I have a destiny that the devil is after. Now, I don't have to fight to try to be normal. Normal is underrated. No such thing as normal. Show me a normal person. There are none. There's either dead, unregenerated people, or regenerated, living people like us. Here's where we stop as we take off into the pressure next week. All of life is one of constant problems, struggles, pressure-filled situations. Shout! So that's your crazy. That's what we shout about. Because I just showed you all the power we have, but now I'm no longer under the delusion that I'm going to have a normal life 
I know I got to get ready for that battle. I'm going to have some problems. I'm going to have some struggles. I'm going to have some pressure-filled situations. But in the middle of all of them, I will have some joy. Come on, join me in understanding what's going on. How do I live tough during this pandemic? How do I live knowing I still have a life on top? I'm telling you guys, even if the bottom falls out, I know who I am. You don't want to miss this teaching. We're going to deal with the kinds of pressures and situations and struggles we have to live with and how you get through them. I know I'm stopping right now, but you don't want to miss this next week because I'm excited right now. Because even if these are the last days, because of who I am, I can live tough. I can live whole. I can live joyful. I can live believe that every day God will supply. This Pastor Duncan saying, have a great night. Let me pray. In case there's an unbeliever out there, we want you to have every opportunity after what you just heard. You don't want to be a dead, unregenerated person who is under the power of Satan. You don't want to be too late. Because if it comes a chance between eating and taking a mark, if you don't have the supernatural power of God, you will probably take the mark. Let's make sure we're not here when that wretched time comes. Pray this with me. Say, Lord God, I thank you for allowing me to hear this word. I thank you that it's not too late for me. I believe you died and rose again with all power in your hand. Because I believe it, come on, say this, because I confess it, I am saved. Hallelujah. You just got born again and there's not a thing the devil can do about it. Our brothers and sisters, join me next week. This teaching is going to take off. You're going to see how no matter what happens, we're going to be so prepared, we're not worried if the world falls apart. Amen. Join us online. Don't forget our Sunday morning worship service, 10 o'clock. Shiloh Baptist, TWO. Go to our YouTube channel. Man, there's some exciting messages on there. Go to our Facebook channel. Look at all of our Facebook activities. Go to our website. You can catch the message of the week. Make sure you see all the ways that we're giving and helping our community. This is Pastor Douglas saying, I'll see you next week. God bless you. Hope this teaching has blessed you tonight.